Good morning and welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. It is great to see you this Wednesday morning. We are picking up for the first time in November after a month of Halloween themes and Halloween talks. Um, we are coming back to our center, which is the history of rug hooking and rug making. And that is squarely where we are this morning. Uh, I've got a great episode ready for you today. We are starting to scratch the surface. If you're I'm distracted by my reflection because my sister did my hair last night. If you're wondering if I suddenly look different, I do. It's kind of an accident, but we'll we'll just go with it for the moment. Um, if you remember last week, I mentioned in passing that I was able to pick up a couple of rugs at the home of this woman called Joanne Wood. And she, um, th this is what we're going to be talking about for this episode and probably for the next couple of episodes because there is so much content here that it is crazy. So this is where I'm going to go with this. Heidi, oh my gosh, Huda Eva, good afternoon and good to see you in Belgium. Sharon, great to see you in Vancouver. The weather keeps changing here too. It's really dynamic. It is not static weather this fall. It is up and down. Uh, it's super sunny today. I hope it's, I hope it's nice where you are. Stephanie, great to see you. Karen, great to see you in Black Forest, Colorado, expecting another big snowstorm. That's what you get for living in Colorado. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's a beautiful state. Um, I feel like I just spoke to somebody. I did. It was the postman yesterday who said that he'd just taken a trip to Colorado and been back. He said it was so beautiful there. He was visiting his son. Um, and I thought, it sounds beautiful. I'm, I'm ready to go. But after the snow is, uh, is all done. Stephanie says, it's 66 in Arizona this morning, and I'm doing a happy dance. Summer is finally over. You can be comfortable, right? You can get comfortable and get cozy. Put those uh, summer clothes away. It's probably it's probably fine. Heidi, this isn't the first snow she's had yet. It's been crazy in Colorado. We get the weather report from around the world here. Crystal, great to see you. I wonder if everybody had a good trick-or-treating night on Saturday. Did little Velma have a good night? Did she go out and do some trick-or-treating? Isn't it funny how one thing ends and another thing begins? I mean, it is that slippery slope to the new year that we are on because there is like um, something sad about Halloween being done already. And I feel like we have got one foot in Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving, and then we are right at the holidays. It's just a lot, isn't it? Uh, in terms of like business, I'm thinking about patterns to put out and things that need doing for the near future. I haven't advertised this yet, but I do have the November pattern ready to go. I'm just working on it and I just pulled it off the frame and it's um, it's a turkey that is more like, you know, I have the native Tom turkey that is like a Native American style uh, wild turkey. Um, and that has been one of the best sellers like all along. But this year I wanted to do more of a Macy's type Tom the turkey with his little hat. So I've been working on it here and struggling with colors and figuring it out as I go. So I'm putting that up as a kit and I'm going to be finishing that in the very near future. Um had a thought and it left me right there. One of the other things I keep forgetting to mention, um, and it's not really time yet, but remember how I have in January, which is quite far away, I have that talk coming up at the big library in Hartford, Connecticut. And um, I, many of you have sent in your Van Gogh rugs for me to exhibit there. Uh, and they will be on display for a while, not just the day that I'm speaking, but like a little bit before and a little bit after. So um, people have a chance to make their way there and come and see that exhibit. And then I'm hoping that that exhibit will move and I will speak to everybody who sent a rug for me to display there. I will be in touch with you for sure just to confirm that you are okay with me shipping the collection of rugs. It'll probably be about 20 rugs to the next person um, in another city who has a place, maybe a public library or some kind of a center, some kind of a civic center or a grange or whatever, um, who might want to, to exhibit the rugs second, right? So in January, they're going to be up in Hartford, Connecticut. If you are new to the show, old to the show, interested in having this exhibit be somewhere around your hometown, it would be great. I will, I will, um, I'm going to be, it's going to be my expense moving the rugs, right? And for you to move them back to me. I would like to see this exhibit go to as many places as it can um, and have everybody's work out there, right? So if you are still working on the Van Gogh chair or a different Van Gogh uh, image or a different image altogether that has the feel of Van Gogh, whether you are looking uh, at that sort of impressionist Starry Night movement 
or the color palette of the blues, the oranges, and the yellows. Whatever it is, if you have something that you would fit into the exhibit, number one, let me know so you can ship it my way and it can go up in January at the first stop. And or if you are somebody who would like to be exhibiting the rugs in your hometown, make sure that you get in touch with me because I know a couple of people are interested and I want to put them sort of on a circuit that makes uh, geographical sense, right? So in putting that together, I've had to come up with a really simple and small um, kit that can be uh, done by a beginner. So done in like primitive number eight. And so I've been working on this. It's a very small project, but it will be sort of in honor of that talk, just a glimpse, just a crop of the starry night. So just a completely random hit or miss style, right? I'm not doing it as a replica of Van Gogh's Starry Night. I'm doing, and there's more than one Starry Night as we know, right? If you took the design like Van Gogh, there's lots of Starry Nights. But I'm just doing it hit or miss style with like a supply of blues on one side, a supply of yellows on the other side, trying to get the main thing in, the moon and the aura around the moon. Um, and I do see that my monitor is changing color, Linda Ann. If you are on there, you are absolutely right. The monitor is driving me crazy and making me seasick. I'm going to have to figure out why it's changing color. I guess I'm moving too much. I will stay. I will stay still. Anyway, let me know um, Let me know what your feelings are about that. If you're sending anything, if you've got ideas, or if you want to be involved in a more direct way in that whole Van Gogh conversation and, uh, and scene. Karen says, you got five inches last week of snow. Doreen, great to see you. Day and night is going well. It is all going well. And tomorrow I get to see Kaz, um, Kazuko Stone. She's in our Facebook group, which is Rug Cooking and Punch Needle Club. She's going to be at the Green Mountain School in um, Vermont, where my class didn't go forward because we did not have enough sign up. So I have a minimum, right? So that's disappointing. But I'm still going up there to photograph the Pearl McGowan Fairy Tale Rug Exhibit and meet Kaz in person. So I'll take some photos of that because I know you know who she is too and we're all buddies, so that'll be fun to document. My mom says, unseasonably warm in Granby. It is the best hour of your day. Mom, I wanted to come visit you this weekend, so we have to talk about that. I was gonna come Saturday into Sunday, just me. Um, Gayla, good to see you in Missouri. <laughs> Anita in London, Ontario, great to see you. Sharon Lee, good morning in Texas. Courtney, good morning. I sent your things in two different packages, by the way. So don't be confused. I ended up sending them separately. It was just easier that way and, and faster. Um, Mary, great to see you in Arizona. Happy seasons. I've got to get rid of this. This is going to confuse us, this backdrop, but I just have not had time yet. Cats Gallery, good morning. Happy Wednesday. Linda, happy Wednesday in New Jersey. Barbara, great to see you. Beverly, great to see you. Linda H., all the buddies are on. Lovely starry rug. Thank you. So this will be available as a beginner kit too for people. And it's going to be super inexpensive. I'm debating if I should do it with just wool, which of course is more expensive, or if I should include um, like Jersey, sorry, silk. Let me know what you think. Um, I'm putting it out there because I want it to be a conversation, um, not just my decision. I thought it would be kind of cool to kind of thrift it up and use a lot of different materials so speaking Courtney sounds good all right let me know let me know that you like everything um, so let's get going with our content today it was oh, it was such a time last Friday it was last Friday before I ran the evening show uh, for cocktail night um, I took this road trip to a different part of Connecticut and um, it's like one of my favorite areas it's in this if you're from around here it's the area around Coventry and um, Mansfield, you know, it's a little bit remote, uh, definitely off the beaten path, really, really pretty, lots of antique stores, super quaint, very idyllic pastoral Connecticut, right? Not like the twilight zone between the cities, but um, really nice trip. And my uh, intention in going there and my purpose for going there was I was picking up a couple of rugs that I found on Facebook Marketplace. Because you know when you find uh, rugs on Facebook Marketplace or on eBay or whatever, there's always the possibility of picking them up in person. So as I often say, for people who live in parts of the country or other countries where rug hooking is not a thing, and it's like always a source of frustration and sadness when you cannot find rugs in person, um, this is always a great option for you because <clears throat> a lot of people will ship. That can be expensive because of the size and weight. Um, or you can pick them up if they happen to be local because you never know if there are people who are local to you 
who have been rug hooking for years or their mother has or someone has and there is this great supply of rugs that is geographically close to you and makes sense for you to go pick up. So that's the situation I was in last Friday when I saw these, average, these ads for these big rugs, much bigger than I thought, pop up on Facebook Marketplace. And it was like an hour drive. So I thought, I'm going to drive over and pick those up. I'm going to show you in a minute. So when I drove over there, um, I understood that the back backstory was that this woman called Joanne Wood, who I had not heard of before, had been making rugs. She's, I think, 84 years old now. She had been making rugs from, okay, somebody's like spamming us with porn. So if somebody wants to catch that and, yeah. She'd been making rugs since she was 19. So that is like 65 years of rug making, which I think is extraordinary for anyone. And it was just, um, it was like such an amazing feeling going into her house because they are on the walls, they are on the floor. These rugs, it's, it's hundreds of rugs, represent her entire life story. And she has been keeping this kind of diary memoir of her entire life from childhood on in the form of rug making, right? And not just her story, um, but her neighbors. She's very involved in her church. Like every, everybody that surrounds her in her orbit is part of this story. She's given rugs. She's, um, she's, she's made rugs of all different subjects, um, you know, not just for herself or other people. So her story overlaps a much larger story of every person who's been in her life. And it was a vast, big story. And um, I was completely overwhelmed in a good way to tap into uh, it's, it just gets me like all emotional and crazy. And I was crying when I was there, which was ridiculous. I couldn't stop holding her hand and crying because I was looking at these rugs and thinking, oh my God, like some of them were, su you're going to see, you're about to see them super, super evocative and sweet. And they're all storytelling rugs. So it got me right in the heart. The two that I picked up were two that were available because a couple of them had already been snapped up had to cry myself to sleep about that one um but thank you for reporting oh constance good to see you wait till you see you know joanne did so many rugs that i'm not going to get to them on shows it's got to be a larger project so i'm i'm talking to her and looking at spending quite a lot of time with her about doing a much bigger project on the history of these rugs. But let's just get started with where I started. And you're gonna see very quickly that the scope of this conversation is so, it's so big that uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't even have a shape yet. So I went over to pick up a couple of rugs that were available. And what had happened, her neighbor, April, who was the kind of go-between middleman, um, she, I went to her house um, so that she could walk me. I parked at her house and then we walked across this field, kind of like British style, to this little gate and into Joanne's house. So Joanne had recently ha tripped on one of the rugs and her daughter wisely, you know, because these rugs are total jack trippers, right? When they're done on the floor, it's, I mean, I'm constantly tripping, tripping on rugs. Um, her daughter took the ones that were in the kind of path of traffic and put them in other places for the time being. And many of them are on the walls, um, but they aren't places where you would easily trip over them because that's like, that's a thought and that's a thing and that's a realistic worry. So um, she, some of these rugs became available because they were taken off the floor. And I can only imagine the kind of patchwork situation that was going on there <laughs> when the rugs were just overlapping each other on the floor, hundreds of rugs, right? So I was surprised, I, I'm not good with numbers at all. And I was surprised when I got there and the rugs were so big, but this is one of the rugs. I'm gonna show you in the slideshow too, but just to give you an idea of the scale, um, we're gonna talk in a minute about materials and technique. It's probably, it's definitely too big. It's definitely too big, um, but it is so, it's so beautiful right so let's look at that a little bit closer up she does all kinds of bindings like this and she's got the thing sewn on the back so you don't trip on the rug that was one of them and that is massive her forgot to say the most important part her rugs are her own design with the exception of two that i know of her she designs her own rugs as she sits there at her homemade frame that is being stretched with nails in it, right? Forget about this idea 
of $1,200 frames with these fancy combs on them. She has got a frame that someone built for her with two by fours and she stretches her burlap because she won't work on anything but burlap over the frame with a bunch of nails around the edges. And that is how she's worked for the last 65 years. So for me, that's an inspiration, right? That's just back backup material. I, I'm gonna expand on that. This is the other rug. It's a little bit smaller, but they were both, um, I thought super whimsical, really successful designs, really, um, what's the word, spontaneous, right? So I'll show you a closer ups of those in our slideshow. Um, let's start looking at slides and then we'll start talking more. One more thing, um, the way that she works, right? And the way that she has always worked, she is self-taught, well, she's taught by her mother who is self-taught. So because of the years of her life that she has been hooking and because she eclipses that middle 20th century period uh, when, and her mother, when Pearl McGowan it was certifying so many people and those teacher was, teachers were certifying other people and they were teaching in this very specific style, her mother never took classes, was not certified and was not taught, but was of that school where she was hooking with very thin strips like number threes. So she self-taught. She taught Joanne, like as a young woman, and Joanne was never, was never interested style-wise in that school of hooking. So Joanne has always hooked in what, if you're a beginner, if what, what we would call the primitive style, so a very wide cut, a number eight or up cut. She's completely aware that wool strips, strippers and wool cutters exist, but she has never used one. She uses a pair of scissors still. And she is of the thrift school of hooking in that all of her materials are materials that she has found. So she is a recycler, a repurposer, right? She is, she is of the spirit of the 1860s hooker, right? Who finds whatever is left over for scrap, cuts it up with scissors and hooks it into backing. She works exactly the same way on a homemade frame. And she sits there and she's got her Sharpies out that are all different colors, right? And she just puts down a design and then she'll add different colors to it or she'll add a different border or she'll add a house or she'll cross a house out. And she just works as she goes. No drawing sketches, no color planning, no transferring the pattern onto backing. It's just done organically as she sits there. And I think that is just an amazing um, method and I think it's an inspiration and I think it's a great reminder that particularly if you're a beginner getting into this craft you don't need a lot of junk that costs a fortune people will sell it to you and if, if it makes you feel more confident or more equipped to get going with that stuff you should but there's absolutely no reason why you have to it can be done with just the most basic and bare materials, right? So Joanne is a great testament to that. Let's start looking at some of the rugs um, that I took pictures of. I took 175 pictures before um, I was completely emotionally like like squeezed tea bag. Like I felt like a squeezed tea bag and I had to just stop because she we ended up sitting with these scrapbooks um, that she had all over the place and I was trying to photograph them and uh, it was, I was completely overwhelmed. It was so much that I just pulled the plug and um, I just like, you know, stuck with the 175 pictures and the idea that I really need to go back and get a better handle on this story. So this is me and Joanne um, standing in front of one, one of her beauties. Uh, Sharon says, I would invest in a cutter only because it would speed things up. You know, Sharon, that's a good point. Investing in a cutter is a great idea. Um, in between the idea of cutting with scissors, which is super time consuming, and a cutter, right, which could be all different prices. You could go over a thousand for a nice one. Um, the Bliss ones, right, the Fraser Bliss ones are more like in the 475s and the heads each cost more money. Um, but between the idea of the cutter and the scissors is the cutter, the rotary cutter. So if you're a quilter or if you've used rotary cutters before, that's faster than scissors. So that's kind of the middleman that's still super accessible and easy to find. Pretty sure, you know, you can go to the local craft store, get that kind of a tool, um, speed up the cutting. But I know what you mean. 
Um, and certainly the fastest kind of cutter that out there that's out there is the Sissex cutter with the trays that are made by the old tattered flag. So we talk about that a lot and I have videos of that online, but that is the fastest cutter because you are able to cut three layers of typical wool, like door wool, um, which for like a number eight gives you 60 strips with one, um, you know, revolution of the wheel, like just putting the tray through one time. So it speed is a big thing. But the way that Joanne works is she's in her, she's in her chair and she works from there and she's got in a, like in a store bag, like a plastic bag on the edge of her um, frame. She's got this bag of all of the noodles and wool strips that are cut, you know, old sleeves and cuffs and wool pieces. She's got them all in that bag. And she described to me how she, when she feels she doesn't have the right color, because of course when you're working in this manner and you are using materials as you find them, um, having the right colors is a huge thing, isn't it? She, she has overcome that problem by, she takes her colors and she does what Edith O'Neill, if you remember our episodes about the old red house and Edith O'Neill and her brand is absolutely amazing and also primitive. Um, the idea is that when you have colors and you need more similar colors, you take a whole pile of your cuffs and your collars and your cutoff sleeves and the noodles that you've already cut and you put them, in Joanne's case, into a crock pot and you marry the colors, right? Because they're in there together, they're kind of stewing, the water is loosening up. Of course, it works better if you're gonna put a little bit of Synthropol in there to loosen the colors, a little bit of citric acid to set the color after you have the right colors. These things help, but it can be done without. So she is very much in the habit of doing it in a very basic manner, putting her bits and pieces into what Edith O'Neill calls the stone soup, the casserole pot or a dish or a pan on the oven, and letting them stew until all those colors loosen and the colors will blend with each other. So you will end up pulling out a collection of, of strips and material and pieces that you're gonna use for your piece. And they are still all different colors, but they have a tone in common. And the tone is the product of all of those colors that are together in that marry bath because you're marrying the colors. So this works great. Um, I should probably do a video on this exact subject. This works great. You would be so surprised to see how many colors you can get and how much color will loosen. Another great thing, side note, another great thing for um, getting new colors introduced is to look for um, ties, the lining on ties, that, that synthetic lining or you know inside skirts or blazers, things like that the lining inside those kinds of articles is loaded with dye, like more dye than you would want. So it's not a bad idea if you're about to throw out some clothes or you have discovered like old clothing or you found some old clothing at Savers or Goodwill or whatever, and you want to create some new colors or marry some colors together because you've got all of these yellows or pinks and they're not your favorite color family and you'd like to kind of mellow them with an, an, a color that you want to marry them under, it's not a bad idea to get some lining fabric ripped out of some old garment, put it into some hot water. Um, if you have Synthropol, put it in there because that will like loosen up the color. It's an agent that will accelerate like the, um, the giving up of the color put it in the water and see what color it is because you might be holding a brown lining and the primary color inside of it might be fuchsia which would be super alarming if that's not what you're looking for so it's always worth cutting off a piece of one of these fabrics that's really rich in dye content and figuring out is it mostly green is it mostly blue brown many things are mostly pink because red is the most dominant color in most colors right that's like the foundation color for most and it's usually the first color that wants to lift. So be careful, but you can work in this way with the idea of the stone soup. This is what Joanne does, and she has a lot of success um, getting way more colors going with this casserole dish. I feel I have to also say that if you are gonna do this, you have to remember that garment dyes, even if it's old clothing and you are take, you're leaching color out of something, garment dyes are different than food dyes, and they are dangerous, right? So it's not as dangerous as emptying a packet of, of uh, dye into a pan, 
but it still has dye content that is poisonous. And the point is you should not use the stuff that you cook with. You should have a separate pan that is just for this, even for leaching and marrying colors, right? Enough. Done with that. Yes, yeah, Suze, I will do a video on that. I will. Because my mouth runs about it a lot and I never do a video. And what you really need is to see how, how it works. Let's come back over to Joanne. So here she is looking adorable. This was just one of the best days of my life, I have to say. It really was. It, she is such a nice person, too. And April was such a nice person. This is one of the rugs I bought. This is the larger one, the one I was trying to hold up, and it was just too big for me to show you. But isn't it lovely? And remember, this is an original design. All of these kinds of um, stylized flowers all over the place, um, hooked quite wide, at least in a number eight cut by scissors. She said she struggles a lot with color in that she always has a lot of camel color. I mean, that's a color that you get a lot is wool, isn't it? Um, it is inspirational, isn't it? I'm just reading your comments. Michelle, it's super inspirational. Um, but you see how she does a little bit of filigree. She does a little bit of outlining. She, she alternates the colors that she's outlining in. Um, she does all different techniques. She's not, she's not consistently working in one style. She's got a very graphic sort of backbone to it, but she's working in a very uh, spontaneous way. And she's working in a way where the 1860s way, where she's running out of a color and then she switches to a different color and the outline changes color. Or some flowers are outlined in, in violet and others are outlined in blue. And it's just the way that it is. It adds to the charm of the piece. It's very Jacobian. Uh, Karen, it is absolutely so Jacobian. Um, and you can see what she's doing here with putting the odd number three flowers in the middle. You know, you know, we always want, in terms of good design, an odd number to be the focal point. When you have an even number, it just doesn't sit well. She knows that instinctively, and she's got the three flowers in the center in this really, um, this wreath of flowers around it with so much variety of color and form, and really none of them realistic. I love this idea she did with these kinds of white rainbow arcs, right, all over the place. It's so smart. It works well. It creates more movement. It's almost like the wind blowing. This, the overall effect of this piece for me looks like constant. She is an impressive artist, isn't she? I mean, this is like, this is the very definition of folk art, isn't it? I mean, she's not trained. She's always worked in the style. She figured out on her own that she likes the primitive style, um, abs at her corners. Everything about it is so super folky. It's important work. It really is. I like the way that she's filled some of the background, left some of the background. But for me, the overall feel of this piece is that it is like an evening, like it's an evening in a garden and there's a little bit of wind blowing around and it's more perfume and, and the idea of color than it is realistic color. All of these cool blues, reds, greens, these are mostly cool colors, right? It gives you the, that, that breezy feeling of, of an evening. Right, and the black background is really helping with that. Let's look close, closer up at some of this. Oh, no, this is the next rug that I got. So this is the other one I was holding up. Has more of like a, like a galaxy feel to it. There's stars or, or some kind of constellation happening. Um, it's all abstract, right? So it's subjective. You, you layer on whatever your thoughts and feelings are. But this is Joanne sitting in her chair where she works holding the other rug that I got, which is considerably smaller. But I thought these go real well together. And I'm going to display them together on the wall so that in the future I have another place to stand and do videos and you'll be able to see these rugs over my shoulder. Um, absolutely, absolutely beautiful. She's got hearts. She's got flowers. This reminds me of that old um, toy spirograph, remember, with all the circles within the circles. She's She's got sort of a paisley feeling happening here, too, with these offshoots. So interesting. It's, it's not a focused work. It's a serious abstract. It's got crazy en energy and colors, uh, very contemporary color palette. It's just an awesome piece. Look to the right in the photo, and you see the side of her frame, and you see that little bag with the blue handles? That's her working bag. So all of her bits and pieces are in that bag. She's already put them into the, um, it is an impressive rug, Stephanie, isn't it? She's already put all of her bits and pieces into the casserole, and she's gotten her color for the rug she's working on. I'll show you that another day, because there's like 170 slides in the middle. 
So anyway, this is the second one that I got. Um, this is the third one that was there and other people had expressed interest in this. So this was not like actively for sale when I got there. And I said to her, let me know if this is, um, if, if, you know, how people are on Facebook with flaking, flaking it. And if they flake out, you know, this, this would be another one that I would pick up. This is a runner size. These are much larger than they seem. What a great idea for a beginner, for somebody who wants to use up their material, for somebody who loves working in the hit or miss style, for somebody who likes the feeling of antique rugs, but feels that you can do um, way more artistic stuff, right, than, than was done in antique years of rug making. So this is really an example of a great idea for a runner, very 1940s style, very controlled border of simple flowers, right? But it's very unified because it has that border. The color changing in the border, I think, gives it this great hit or miss feel. And in the middle of the rug, in the body of the rug, she has divided it up into very pop art squares, very Andy Warhol, very graphic, a little bit of swatch watch art happening here. But she's broken it up into squares like a crazy quilt, but a bit more formulaic, isn't it? Every square represents either like a quilt design, a pattern, a pictorial, something. And she has been thoughtful about making each square different, putting the colors in places where they balance and excite. Um, it's, it's another improvised work. She does, I want to reinforce this point, she does not color plan. She does not like labor over it. She keeps her Sharpies right next to her and she draws as she goes. So if she feels like she's got too many diagonals happening here and she needs another flower, boom, flower time. Then it's like race, racing flag checkerboard or a little house, you know. That's how she works. And that is for me part of the inspiration because it's so organic. And I think with this craft, oh, Lynn, great to see you. I think with this craft, it is so easy to trip yourself up getting sort of waylaid or going down these weird cul-de-sacs of technique and method. Um, I think it's easy to get stuck in those places, just chasing your tail when y you could free yourself up so much, work smarter and work faster, work in a style that is more consistent with like who you are and putting your yourself out there style-wise, color-wise, design-wise to work in a way like Joanne works, right? So, and of course it always depends on you if that's in your comfort zone. I'm not technical at all, as you know. So I struggle when I put pieces together and I screw stuff up again and again and again. Um, other people are more technical and they're like, show me the pattern, give me the paint by number, you know, give me, give me directions in uh, minutia, tell me exactly where this goes and that's their comfort zone. But if that's not your comfort zone, you should think about the way that Joanne works. It is so um, basic, isn't it? And it works great. And it's a good thing for you if you are a really technical person, it's a good thing for you to, as an exercise, when the spirit moves you, to try working more in that style. Just loosen it up, see where it goes, right? Nothing bad is gonna happen. You might end up with a work that's a bit more fluid or a bit more colorful than what's normally in your wheelhouse. But hey, wheelhouses are meant to, to have walls taken down and more things added. And if you put more techniques and more dares into your, your little basket of tricks, I think you're gonna find that you're way more confident um, and just have a wider and more varied body of work. Dawn, great to see you. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I hope it was a good day. Now, when we were there, you know, I was looking around. I, I last took pictures of things that were up on the walls. Um, while we were there, she said, oh, you know, I should get under my rug, uh, under my bed and pull out all the rugs that are under there. And some of these rugs had been under there for a really long time. So this is part of like what got me feeling so emotional because it was like going on a treasure hunt in somebody's house and April's down on her hands and knees and I was to pulling rugs out from under the bed and unrolling them on top of the bed and looking at them and even Joanne hadn't seen some of these in a really long time. Um, if you hear noises, that's my stomach. I am so hungry right now. Just ignore, just ignore the weirdness. Um, so she had done like uh, obviously over the years, lots of rugs that had been on the floor for decades and this was one of them and you know I asked her when I saw this rug if she was also a quilter because 
quilters out there, Barbara, you're looking at this and I bet you're saying this is a pinwheel design. This is a traditional quilting design and it's kind of mixed with the idea of a crazy quilt, um, but it's very, very different. And the answer was no, she was, she's never been a quilter. She doesn't enjoy quilting. This is her passion. So, you know, she has pulled from textiles and this is something I meant to latch up to earlier. Inspiration for her she pulls from textiles, she pulls from pages of magazines that she rips out, that she sees, that she likes a certain scene, and then she sketches it directly onto her backing. She pulls from all kinds of things. And April, her neighbor, said, you know, sometimes I see a picture somewhere that I think Joanne might be inspired by. So I bring it and I drop it off at the house, and it's just in her pile of things to look at. This is where her inspiration comes from. It's absolutely everywhere. Um, so in this case, you know, this is very quilt, quilt driven, right? The central motif is, is exactly like a pinwheel star. Um, so she knows this, she knows this motif. She liked it. Technically very difficult getting that center in. This is a large rug. Um, Joanne is very religious and that was like, it was part of the coziness of being there, knowing that like she hosts like a church group a couple times a week and, um, a lot of her rugs are faith driven. This rug had a lot of variety. So I felt I could ask her, you know, um, I think I see a menorah in here. I think I see um, different motifs that represent different faiths. And she said, of course. She said, I just wanted to create with this rug something that represented spirituality for everybody, not just me, right? So this has a lot of text in it. And she's using one of the things that I noticed that she does. Um, <laughs> you're digging it, Dawn. Me too. Um, she uses a lot of different fonts. So this is a completely different font than, than she's used in other rugs. And this is like a bold font. And one of the ways, I'm sure that you know this, but I'm just going to say it anyway, that with your rugs, if you want to introduce text and you want different fonts, and it is not a great priority for you to develop your own distinct font, right? It's fun to just go into like a program like Word and, t and type the alphabet out and then pull down the box that gives you like a hundred choices for different fonts and use those fonts or copy those fonts because Joanne is using so many different fonts. I'm thinking this is probably how she does it. I didn't think to ask her while I was standing there. I will ask her in the future, but this is like a total copper plate, kind of a bold face font. And she's introduced words like kindness, love, forgiveness, peace, um, prosperity. I mean, she is patience, mercy. I mean, this is, this is certainly a rug with a religious theme, but going toward the holidays, I think that this is a beautiful rug. Um, it's a great one to approach if you love crazy quilt and the opportunity to sort of insert different motifs, musical motifs, um, fish, birds, flowers, butterflies, everything into a rug. This is a great rug. The skeleton for this rug with that motif in the center is fantastic for that. One of the things I forgot to say at the beginning of the show that is important is I'm going to start carrying, because she has all original designs, I'm going to start carrying a bunch of her designs and licensing them from her. So when people buy her designs, I kick back money to her and then she can get more materials or whatever she needs. Um, and then I can put her body of hundreds of rugs out there so that if they speak to you, you can do them too. So I'm going to be, it's going to take some time, but I'm going to be loading most of her designs as patterns. I've got two ready for today. I didn't have time to put into the body of the text for this video, but be looking for them later in the body of this video under the description and also on our Facebook group, which is Royal Cooking and Punch Needle Club. I will link up um, two of the designs that she did that are available right now. And needless to say, her designs are great for beginners. Um, because they are very primitive, they are very folky, they are very naive. She has already hoped them. So there is a color plan in place that you can take it or leave it kind of a thing. Um, but at least it's there as a suggestion if you're a beginner, right, and you're worried about struggling with color. This is one of the designs I will certainly be putting up because I think this is great any day of the year. But some of her more religious designs I think are going to be especially great over the holidays. Let's look close up. Um, at the rug. Now remember these rugs have been on the floor for a long time. This was one of the ones that was rolled up under the bed. Barbara says, oh fantastic, do that floral one. I definitely will. I definitely will, uh, without a doubt. They are just too good to be true. And it, doesn't it feel good whether you are a person who likes to do your own designing or not? You know, I, I do. 
but it still feels great to kind of ride the coattails of someone else's dream and life and their work and to celebrate their story by hooking one of their pieces. That's why I still am always looking and buying rugs that have been made by other designers, not because I don't have enough to hook, because I want to own and collect a part of them um, and think about them while I hook pieces that are other people's work. Barbara is a classic example of this, like Alice Butler, who we covered a lot last year. We're still not done talking about. Um, but these people who have popped up through time who are very hard to find, who have um, contributed to the body of work that is like the rug hooking catalog, and nobody has seen their work yet. Nobody has seen her work yet. So it's great to kind of jump on this and, um, and make interpretations of her rugs that are more in your style with your colors, with your special spin on them. So this is a close up of this crazy quilt rug. And for a beginner, this is a more uh, complicated rug because we're talking about a lot of really acute angles that are a little bit on the hard side to hook. Um, but all of the motifs are there and could be switched out. Right? This is pulling away a little bit further. I don't know if you noticed, but on this rug, she had a really thin red border um, that works really well. For this rug, the red is what we call in rug hooking the poison color because it's the brightest color in the rug. So it's nice that she used the poison as the border too because it really pulls in all of the busyness of this rug. You can get away with having a rug this busy when you're doing something that feels like a crazy quilt design because your eye is already familiar with what that form looks like and it makes a lot of sense. Um, to have that without the chaos and the angles and the irregularity of the lines, it wouldn't feel like a crazy quilt. It would feel like chaos. So within the structure of a known form that is quite familiar, you can get away with going crazy with colors. Um, Barbara says, this woman deserves the recognition. I'm so glad too. That's why it was like such a super emotional visit because I just, I felt like I was so lucky and I felt like it was a privilege to be able to sit in her living room and like, hold her hand and look at her rugs with her and talk about the stories behind the rugs. It was a super privilege and I could have easily missed it by not looking at Facebook that day. And that's what scares me. So note to self, right? You should be looking at your local Facebook and seeing if people are listing multiple rugs because it could be a situation where someone's life is changing and they're getting rid of a huge body of work that we haven't seen yet. Um, and, and, and that should be seen, right? So we tend to, own, this is a horrible sentiment, but we tend to only discover people's work when they have passed away. And that is, that's something that should change because being a little bit proactive, you can catch people while they are still actively working and, um, and get all of their stories out of them, right? This, let's, let's not follow that through too much. Grandma Moses is a good example, Karen. That's a good example. So this is another rug. I think this is one of my favorite rugs that she did. And this is another one that was under the bed. Um, there's a few things about this that I think are extraordinary. It's got a really pronounced split down the center. So there, I forget the story behind this one because I was seriously an overload. Um, and I was getting all like crazy and, you know, uh, it was hard. It was hard to take it all in. And I was trying to remember all the stories without holding us up and, and slowing it down. Um, and this was the beginning, so I didn't have any feel yet for how much there was to know and to, and to learn. So I feel like this is this is obviously a story rug, and I feel like she's telling the story of home and church, and she's kind of split the rug, and she's got them side by side. It could be that it's a continuous landscape, but color-wise, I don't think so. I'm going to have to go back to her on the specific one. Um, I love the composition for this. To me, this is the ultimate folk art landscape. Um, the church for her is always in the center, right? Because of her faith. So she's got the, the church firmly in the center with a lot of detail, the church steps and everything. She's got, she's got some shading happening here. Um, she's got like some seasonal stuff happening in the background, right? It looks like maybe late summer. It's super lush, super green. Remember, she's only using materials that she has and she's only able to use colors that she can produce at home or that she's found. So it's not like she's going to pull out a swatch and choose from 75 different colors of teal. She's figuring this out with what she's got. Dawn says, I'm feeling so excited and inspired. Can't wait to get in the studio. Oh, Dawn, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Get in the studio while you're feeling it, right? Because it doesn't, it doesn't always come and it doesn't always stay. Look at the foreground in front of this church. She's used some kind of a tweed material or a plaid. It's a patterned wool. 
Um, in contrast to over on the left, she's managed to plug in that bit of camel coat, and she really hates the camel, but she plugs it in where she can because she's always got an overabundance of camel color. Great tree on the right, Stephanie. Oh, it is. Let's look at that tree closer up. That is a really great. Do you see the farmland in the back, how she's broken it into like, there's a hillside that's broken into tracks and stuff. Um, it's just amazing. Look at the shape of the bushes in front. Like she's, she shaped it out in, in just a crazy, crazy way. There's a little bike. The family, I think, could be her family on the left. That could be a little red schoolhouse. Again, I'm going to have to come back to her. There was a few moments that I just kind of blacked out. I was that like worked up. This is the family close up in this uh, slide. And you can see there's kind of a checkerboard in the bottom, which is maybe a patio, something like that. Um, I did some close ups because I wanted you to be able to look at knowing that she's not using milled wool. She's not using like the store bought stuff, right? That's already been refined. She's just cutting up coats. So I just wanted to show you, for example, in this piece, that is a massively dynamic patterned wool. And it might not even be wool. It could be cotton because she often uses cotton, not cotton jersey, but non-stretch cotton. She's not a big fan of jersey and stuff that stretches. So that, that red and white print there, I have no idea what that is. Um, but she uses it quite a bit in this rug, and it's, it creates an extraordinary effect. Another thing to think about if you're having a studio day after this episode is just attacking your um, your your multis, right? Your patterned wools, your tweeds, your herringbones, all that stuff. Just cut a sliver off and hook it up a little bit to see what pattern it gives. Because whatever the colors are, you know it's not going to look like the material, right? Because it's going to be scrunched into four times or five times smaller surface space. So you don't know how it hooks until you actually start hooking it. And with that in mind, it's worth taking some time to hook up some of your weird materials uh, just to get a feel for what what they will look like when you plug them into the composition. Let's look a little bit more at this one. I'm not going to go too far because I don't want to rush these slides. Let's come up here. So this is another, this is her border. Did you notice the diamond border, how well done it was? I know a lot of people don't agree with this and I know I'm going to get like some nasty grams if I say this again, but I'm still going to say it again. People who work on burlap are very happy with burlap. These rugs were down on the floor for decades. Um, they are still super intact, right? So yes, like yes, scientifically burlap does rot faster than cotton monk's cloth or linen or newer materials um, that we seem to prefer now, but there is nothing wrong with burlap and burlap is affordable, particularly if you're not putting your rug on the floor, you don't have to worry. It's up to you, but you don't have to worry if it's going to last for 200 years or 400 years, right? It's just, it's up to you. If it's going on the wall, it's going to last. And if it's going on the floor, burlap is not ideal. But many people, including Joanne, like working in burlap. And one of the reasons for that is because the as a woven, right, all of these backgrounds are wovens. Um, as a woven, it's super loose. It's the loosest one, with linen being a close second. So if you're working into burlap, you've got that grid. It's really pronounced. It's not good for you if you work with narrow cuts like number threes, number fours, even number fives. Or if you work with like a thin weight yarn, right? Like if you're doing stuff with sock yarn or even worsted weight, it's not a great backing for you. But if you work like, if you work like, um, why am I blacking out? Joanne does, I'm sorry. Um, and you're cutting up stuff with scissors, then burlap is a great background because that grid is so pronounced that when you wanna do something like she did with the diamonds on the corner of this, you don't just get the top to bottom grid really pronounced, you get the diagonal grid too. And that's the thing with hooking wide cuts is it's very hard with monk's cloth, rug warp, to get that diagonal. It's very hard to see the diagonal because the woven is so tight, but when the woven is a little bit looser, you get the chance to run some really crisp diagonals. So another thing to be said in favor of burlap, and then I'll wait for those nasty grams to come. Hey, Allie, good to see you. All right, let's do a little more looking before I log off. Um, all right, hang on. Okay, so this is a this is a close up of the center of the composition. So, just looking at our people, this is another one I'll put online. I'll put as many of them online. It won't be t today. I have two up today, but it will be soon because you know I have to take off for Vermont tomorrow. I will be with you on Friday night for cocktail night. So, um, so that's that's there, and we'll be coming back to Joanne certainly on Friday night. Sharon said, will burlap work with finer yarns? Um, so Sharon, 
Burlap will work with finer yarns, but the thing, I mean, you have to worry about the practical problem of when you're pulling up loops. If your burlap is super wide open, like, you know, Grand Canyon type holes, right, which it can be if you get it at Joann's or one of the craft stores, if it's very sort of rustic burlap, your holes are really big and you want your loops to stay. And if you're a low hooker as opposed to a high hooker, like no jokes there, um, you know, you worry about it more, right? So if I were hooking with a thin gauge yarn, like a, like a sock yarn or something like that, and I wanted to use burlap, I would be doubling or quadrupling up my yarn. So in other words, if you have a skein of yarn or a cake of yarn, you have to cut it. You can't work straight from the skein like you otherwise could, just punching or hooking. You have to cut it and then double it up or quadruple it up. And it will pull up two or four loops every time and the work will go fast, but it will mean that inside every opening, there is enough material to keep the loops up and they're not gonna slide out or pull out by accident. So that would be my only concern um, with using fine cuts with burlap. But otherwise, burlap is what was always used. We have gotten very fancy and high horse, uh, but we can always return to it. Lynn says, I have access to free coffee bags. Will they work, coffee bean bags? Uh, will they work for needle punch? Well, okay, so the thing with this, right? So this isn't an easy, this isn't an easy answer. This is like kind of a moving target answer. So Lynn, the thing with needle punch is that you're working with that sharp tip on the needle punch. And when we're talking about burlap, particularly like this utilitarian kind that's been used for like feed sacks and, and coffee beans and stuff like this, it's super brittle. So my only concern, it's, the answer is yes. A lot of people hook into linen and burlap. My concern with it for myself if I was doing it was I would be almost done with the project and I would punch a little bit into the wrong place and rip the material, like rip the, because it's so brittle. That would be my worry. I would not hesitate about hooking into like coffee bean sacks. And, and if, if people feel differently, because I know most people on this thread have more uh, experience with punch needle than I do. I wish Rebecca was on, like she was on Monday, she's a punch needle queen. But if you have a different opinion, please say it. Mine is not the definitive. I'm just telling you when I punch, I get very nervous about how sharp that tip is and about the possibility of it breaking holes through the backing fabric, which I've seen it do when I've been teaching students going right through cotton monk's cloth with all that stretch and give, making huge holes in the backing. So that would be that would be my concern about that. Uh, I'm sorry, it can't be a bit more definitive and helpful, but um, for me, it would be it would be a hazy no. But for someone else might say like yes by all means. Uh, and I would defer to them because I'm not as much of a puncher as I am a hooker. So let's see where we're at. Um, let's just finish this rug up because I had about 10 more I thought I'd get to today and it didn't happen. This is a little motif she uses in the bigger picture. This is like a little fence that's breaking off parts of the overall landscape. So she's got things partitioned off like in pigeonholes. And she's gone really sort of deco style um, stylist with these big fat bushes and this little filigree fence. And then she's plugged in again, this red and green um, patterned wool. And you can see it's not like refined. She probably had a lot of trouble um, pulling up the loops because you can see that it's a very loose weave, the patterned material. And it was probably a nightmare to hook. And it's always gonna come back to that question of how much can you take? If you don't mind and you love the material and you love the pattern that it's giving as you go, then you stick with it. If it's driving you crazy because all these little threads are coming up here and there and you're gonna have to cut them later, then it's not for you. Only you know how much aggravation you can take. I can take a lot because I love these odd materials. Joanne can take a lot, but you have to do what's right for you because if the hooking part of rug hooking is not fun, you're just gonna put it down and not go back to it. Karen says, I punched my 42 inch wide hexagonal rug on linen. Didn't think about poking a hole. And Karen, I'm guessing you didn't poke a hole. Karen, how um, sort of waxy was the finish of your linen? Was it like primitive linen or was it like, was it hairy? It sounds gross, but you know what I mean? Because that would be the distinction because something like a coffee bean sack is super um, dry and hairy. Maybe we better stop. <laughs> Let's move on. So this is the front of the red schoolhouse or something. You can see she's got something on the inside too. She often does these little Norman Rockwell type jokes and puts like a little something in the window. We'll look at that on Friday's episode. This is a little bit of the border that we're seeing here. I guess this, this could be a schoolhouse with the chimney, but this is another one of her beautiful trees in the background. 
and she has achieved this look in the tree that gives it it's got like all four seasons in one tree it's so pretty she's got some solid wool, wool and she's got some color changing wool um, it's not all wool of course so you know the thing if do you know that Stephen Sondheim musical Sunday in the Park with George where they talk about flecks of light and dawn and it's like just the idea that when you're pulling up little bits and pieces each loop each tiny component is like its own color story and when you put them next to each other the story shifts and you get more of an overall feel. And it's almost like pointillism as like a form, right? You get closer to it, it seems very graphic, you step further back from it, it's more like a feeling or like light. So this is what's happening with her trees and this is how she does this. She keeps color changing and, and, and pulling single strips, very hit or miss style, uh, from what she's got and she just plugs them in as she goes and she's not very careful and thoughtful about how she's doing it. And as a result, it gives this glow to the tree that you can't copy. I'm sorry about that, but you can't and I can't either. It's completely unique. Let's stop there because that's another rug um, for next time that we'll start with on Friday. So uh, I just wanted to let you know the ones that I put online for today are two of her favorite rugs that I that I saw so far. So one of these and the links to these again are on ribbonkangyhooking.com. They will be in the description of this video. Um, this is one of them, right? So you'll see this on our Facebook page on ribbonkangy.com. This is not one we got to in the slideshow. This includes text, and this is a perfect beginner's pattern. It says, welcome to the Wool Bits house. And she has done a classic, again, very quilt-driven, schoolhouse design, very Joan Moshimer, right? And she's broken it up into crazy patchwork, very hit or miss style. She's even done a little bit of proddy in the background. She's got a tiny birdhouse here on a stick in front of an evergreen, and then she's got more of a summery tree here. So I'm putting this pattern out, and it is out as just the schoolhouse for beginners that comes as a kit with lots of different colors, and the materials will be mixed in the style of Joanne between being wool, cottons, jersey, silk sari material, and cut up sweater material. So there will be at least five different materials in every kit, and the kit is colorful. So as a beginner pattern, it's just the house. But if you are ambitious or you are not a beginner and you would like to do the whole joke, welcome to the Woolbits house, this is also available as the whole pattern. So that's online now. And I put this one online now. I squared it out for her. So this should be here. This is called um, City Sidewalk. So this is, this is the only city view that she's done, and she thought it was a great joke. If you can see inside this window here, um, because she was very religious, I didn't go too far with jokes and things because I was kind of feeling my way, but um, she said, look at, the, look at that and see if you can tell what's going on in the window there. And I looked at the window and I thought, God, that looks like the lamp from Christmas Story, but I don't want to say it because maybe that's like not, I don't know. I mean, the, mo the movie seems fine, but you never know. And it, well, it is. It's the leg lamp from Christmas Story. So that's her little joke, and that's why I called it City Sidewalks, because I was thinking of the song Silver Bells. So this is also another great geometric, great for beginners. This is also available as a pattern at Ribbon Candy Hooking. Those are the two that I have up so far. Be looking for that later today, because I won't be around tomorrow. Um, but I will be back with you on Friday for an evening show where we will pick up this conversation and look at at least another 50 of her slides, of her rugs. Um, another thing that I'm going to put up later today is our next design like I screwed up this past Sunday's design like so that is going to rerun this coming Sunday night at the correct time which is 6 to 8 p.m. and that is designing like the fairy tale storybook so that will be the last chance to do that class live with me um, and then I will be introducing later today the next design like um, um, subject and it's going to be a split kind of getting ready for Christmas. It is going to be designing like, and this sounds like an unco uncomfortable bedfellows here, but Escher and William Morris, because we will be looking at creating patterning that repeats, right? Tessellations, which we talk about a lot, quilters too, um, but just the idea of creating a repeat pattern is difficult, and it can be done in many different ways. Uh, and this is something that William Morris was a master of during the arts and crafts period, but more recently, Escher was a master of. We're not doing detailed staircases with 12 bends. We're just looking at the idea of how do people who have historically um, created iconic work that involves tessellating and pattern uh, twisting, how do they do that? And how can I do that in my designing? 
that's what the next design light class will be so be looking for that later today um using the blue sky flex in the trees replicates reality sky yeah using the blue in the trees is a good move because exactly it, it when you see blue in the background it feels like it's picking up on the sky behind it and you don't have a solid tree shape that is smart um I stumbled into this. Oh, Mary, I'm glad that you are feeling lucky and blessed. It's good to have you there. And yeah, it's a good it's a good inspiration subject being with Joanne and looking at her work. And as I say, this is the beginning of a story. So I'll probably be spending a lot of time with her and we'll have lots more conversations. And if you have questions about her work so far, make sure you send them to me at ribbancandyhooking at gmail.com. So next time I see her, which will probably be sooner rather than later, I can ask her what your questions are and we can get all of the answers that we need. We need to put her story together and keep her story in the front so that people become aware of this huge body of work that's out there. Oh, Anne, you are welcome. Good to see you, Lynn. Good to see you, too. You're welcome. I will see you all on Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Cocktail Night, where we will continue this conversation. Again, if you need me in the meantime, just write me at uh, ribbonkantyhooking at gmail.com, but I will be off the grid tomorrow um, visiting with Kaz.